So uh, having done the, the mathematical rigor that is required to handle electromagnetics, we now come to this bit where we are now introducing the concepts of electrostatic fields. And we start with the introduction, the Kurov's law, the field intensity, and the electric fields due to continuous charge distributions. And there we are going to be talking about the line, the line charge and uh, line charge density, how they did it. Uh, after that, we are going to be discussing about uh, discussing about the cut. You are not going to discuss now. We are going to discuss about the cut uh, later. So we continue with uh, with our class. Any questions regarding the cut? Reserve them to the uh, to the to the latter section of the the class. But for now, only ask questions that are directly related to what we are talking about. And if you have any problem listening or hearing or seeing the screen, uh, be sure to let us know. So, so that is uh, where we are in regard to, that is what we need to do today. And uh, of course, we are using the class notes in case you have not, uh, if still you don't have access to the class notes, they have been shared on Google Classroom. Uh, without uh, necessarily repeating ourselves, you can ask a colleague of yours to show you uh, what that entails. And uh, of course, there's a small note about the, the, the man, uh, Charles Augustine D. Kurub. You can take some time and discuss and read how he came up with the, the Kurub's law. So we are starting on uh, the chapter four of the class text, but again, I never shared the entire uh, text. I just shared some excerpts of the notes. So they are, those, in my view, are sufficient to assist you go through the material. Of course, there's a nice quote here that from Benjamin Franklin, and that tells you that uh, the person who is wise is the one that who learns from everyone. The powerful one is the one who governs his passions. And the one who is rich is the one who is content. So I don't like the, other, the latter bit, but nevertheless, we are told that nobody achieves all those uh, goals except the one who keeps on trying. So without uh, much ado, we start uh, with the introduction. And we are saying now that having mastered some essential mathematical tools needed for this course, we are now prepared to study the basic concepts of electromagnetics. We shall begin with those fundamental concepts that are applicable to static uh, or time invariant electric fields in free space. So for the material space, we are going to be discussing in a later chapter. So we are going to constrain ourselves to discussing our electrostatic or electric fields that are not moving. So here we are talking about two items that, that first, we are not going to deal with the um, uh, motion of, uh, of charges. So this one is going to be done at a later class. And number two, we are, going to, we are, we are only going to deal with the uh, static charges. So, oh, sorry, of course that is what, what that means. We are going to, to discuss uh, charges in, uh, in, in, in a vacuum or free space. So for, for the other materials that uh, are in the material medium, uh, like uh, the material we normally work with every day, uh, be it water, be it air, be it glass, etc., uh, those material we are going to discuss in another uh, class. So we are going to restrain ourselves to uh, material uh, vacuum or free space. And number two, we are going to, to deal with the static charges only. So that is the, the, the starting point, and we are being told that the first or the, the first example of, uh, of, of application of uh, electrostatics is in cathode ray tube. And I've made a small note here that if you remember the old PVs, they used to have a gun. It, they, of course, they used to be much wider. And if I can illustrate to you very briefly, 
uh, the, the screen used to take that shape, but then for those who might have gone to a, a repair, uh, TV repair person, you might have seen something that looks like like this. And uh, this is this used to be the gun that uh, somehow uh, transmits electrons uh, in various densities to the screen and you are able to see a picture. So that is the oldest uh, application of electrostatic uh, uh, field and just mentioned it. So before we commence our study of electrostatics, again, we might consider it helpful to examine some of the areas in which uh, this study is important or is applicable. Electrostatics is a fascinating subject that has grown in diverse applications. Uh, firstly, you, it is applicable in power transmissions, X-ray machines. So when you go to a hospital and uh, you, you are sent behind a, a machine that takes your X-ray, notice that the, the concept you're learning today is yeah, very really applicable there. Then lightning uh, protection. Of course, some of you may not have noticed, but uh, if you observe houses, uh, you might observe something that takes the shape or that, that, that looks like that, or yeah, I think takes that shape uh, in, in most houses. It, it, could, ah, sorry. it could be it could be a big building, even even our in our own university, you might see something that takes this shape. This is an, a, a lightning alester that uh, in the event there is a possibility of a lightning, and I believe in the past class we mentioned how lightning happens, is that a cloud uh, generates or accumulates some charges and, and it looks normally uh, six for a chance to discharge. So if it comes to a, a near the building and uh, it emits this arrester, this lightning arrester, uh, it will trigger the flow of electrons uh, through the arrester. This is normally a copper cable that lands to the ground so, so that instead of the lightning hitting the building, it goes uh, to the ground. And therefore the, the ground is, uh, is, has infinite capacity to handle charges and therefore uh, the negative charges are absorbed or uh, the, the, the word here is that they are arrested before they strike a house. Otherwise, if it, we never had this one and the crowd comes, it would actually cause uh, charges to flow through. And if you find any me metallic object or a conductor, uh, it would uh, allow the flow of charge. It is normally very high voltage, and that would be equivalent to uh, electrocution. That, uh, that, and I believe some of you have had that uh, people have been killed in the past by, uh, by lightning. So that is uh, the simple principle of uh, lightning arresters that are used in, uh, or that uses the concept that we are studying today about electromagnetic. So that is what we have just said. Then we are saying the other devices that use uh, electrostatics like solid state electronics. Uh, in particular, you find resistors capacitors uh, have very significant use of electrostatics. Uh, of course, there are many concepts that, are, uh, that you can lead through. We don't need to go through them in, in entirety, but uh, you, you just go through uh, those short uh, highlights. You can see how applicable the electromagnetic or electrostatics is in everyday life. So we begin our study of electrostatics by investigating two fundamental laws. The first one is Coulomb's law that we are going to be discussing today, and uh, Gauss law that we probably are going to be discussing next week. Both of these laws are, are based on experimental studies that, and they are interdependent. Somehow, uh, what Coulomb's law says is might be very significant or similar to what Gauss law says except that they say in different formats or in different uh, ways. Although Coulomb's law is applicable in finding electric field due to any charge distribution, 
it is easier to use Gauss row when charge distribution is symmetrical. So what we are, we are saying that uh, Gauss, uh, Coulomb's row might, was the first row to come up with method of finding the charge or electric fields associated with charge in a medium. But then Gauss row came up with some easier methods of finding uh, the charge distribution in a symmetrical medium. Like symmetrical, when you say symmetrical, you're also talking about a, a line, a service area, a volume that you can be able to quantify in terms of uh, uh, in metric form. Uh, based on Coulomb's law, the concept of electric field intensity will be introduced and applied to cases involving uh, involving point, line, service, and volume charges. Special problems that can be solved with much effort are uh, using Coulomb's law. Of course, as I, as I have mentioned, they are much easier solved using Gauss law. So we just introduce both of them, and then we find the applications uh, at different uh, points. Throughout our discussions in this chapter, we will assume that electric field is in, is in vacuum or free space. That's something we have already said. And electric fields in material will be covered in a later chapter. So uh, we now delve deep into what the Coulomb law says. And uh, I think we have already introduced this concept. The only thing that we need to mention is that it says uh, the Coulomb law states that the force between two point charges, Q1 and Q2, is always along. So the first word you need to know. Is along, it's not, is along the line joining them. So it is either an attraction force or repulsion force. So if, if Q, Q1 is attracting Q2, the, the force of attraction is acting along the line joining the two charges. And uh, the other point that we're saying is that, which we have, I, we have already mentioned before, is that the cool, uh, the group cool law states that the force between two points, two point charges, is directly proportional to the product of the charges themselves. We are talking about uh, the product Q1 and Q2, and we're saying that there is a direct proportionality associated with the force uh, with these two. So you're saying that force is equal to there is a constant of proportionality that relates Q1 and Q2. And lastly, that the force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance separating them. So a uh, square of the distance separating them, if we quantify the distance to be, to be R, then uh, we can say that the force is inversely proportional to R squared. So of course, mathematically is what we have just uh, illustrated there. It is, it is mentioned in equation 4.1. And we have said that K is a constant of, of proportionality. And it depends on the choice of the system of units. So in SI units, K is given by, uh, K is given by one over four pi epsilon naught. Epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space. And the permittivity of free space is a, is a inverse of constant. I guess uh, my, my font is maximum, Mr. Bet. So I think that is the maximum we can get, so that I can, can get somewhere to write. So of course you can you can see uh, we are saying that uh, our permittivity of free space is a uh, universal constant that is defined as 8.854 times 8 to the minus 12, or uh, this other term that says 10 to the minus 9 over 36 pi. in fats per meter, 
or farads per meter, sorry. And therefore, uh, that is just a constant. But you are saying that the constant of proportionality k is has a factor of 4 pi as defined there. And therefore, if you are to give it a value after doing multiplying this value, this value with 4 pi, you get nine, approximately nine times 10 per nine meters per farad. So that is our constant of proportionality that uh, was developed by Kulub, uh, the guy named Kulub. So uh, there's a figure here, figure 4.1, that now co converts or assist us convert the Kulub flow from, uh, uh, from the scalar form to the vector form. And it's just a Kulub vector force. Now we are able to get a Kulub vector force on point charges Q1, Q2 at a point, uh, probably at a point in the origin. So how would we do that? And first we have already said how we define uh, Kulub's law. This is in scalar form. So in, that, that is in the scalar form, but then as we have delved, delved much with the vectors in our previous sessions, then we have no option but to discuss force, which is a vector in vector form. So we are saying that uh, we can describe the force uh, in the form F12. And we are saying that when you say F12 is the force on Q2 due to Q1. And the point charges Q1 and Q2 are located at points, are located at points uh, having position vectors R1 and R2. So in few words, we are saying that uh, that is the position vector of point charge Q1 and R2 is the position vector of point charge Q2. So in the past, we never cared because all we were concerned about is the distance between them. But now if you are to describe the distance in terms of a vector, we are saying that uh, a vector R12 can now be described as uh, the position vector R2 minus the position vector R1. So ideally that is how we uh, we get equation four, five, four, five, eight. And moving on, we say now that, but now from our knowledge of mathematics, we can be able to know that we have another squared here, but we also need now to have a unit vector. And of course, I know we defined the unit vector in our mathematical analysis that we did um, in our previous sessions. And we came up to say that any vector A can be described as having a scalar A and a unit vector A uh, that we described with a hat. So in a similar manner, we said that A hat can always be obtained from the vector itself divided by A. Or, and A is normally the magnitude of the vector itself. So that is how we get uh, this concept. So having defined, uh, derived these uh, two points, and we, of course we are saying that uh, R is always the magnitude of the vector, so without forgetting that, we can substitute some, do some derivations or substitutions of equation 4.5 uh, into equation 4.4, and what that allows us to do is that we replace the AR with, uh, with the values that we have found, and R with the value that we have found for, for R, and the R12 gives us R2 minus R1. So what we actually get is equation 4.6b. Uh, 4 so 4.6b, 4, 4 yeah, in, in few words, just tells you that we have obtained the magnitude of the vector, which is R2 minus R1, but then because it was a square and R itself, 
and AR, remember that AR or the A cup, sorry. And the A cup has a magnitude at the denominator. So remember that now in our form, our, our AR will become, I think I can come over this side, AR uh, has the R itself, R12 as a vector, and R, which is, uh, of course, this is the scalar. So having the scalar, you can always now replace it uh, with its value, which is, which is R2 minus R1, and we are able to get that value. But uh, since we have already had R before, so the R that, that we obtain here joins with that other R and we end up with R cubed. cubed. And I was actually mentioning here in my uh, preview of the notes that you should always observe how we are transitioning from being R squared to being R cubed. It is very important because some people might confuse and say that, uh, well, it's also R squared in scalar, so it is always R squared even in vector. But as you can see in the vector form, we have uh, R, R cubed in the bottom or in the denominator, but still R vector uh, in the numerator. And when we remove that, it allows us to define, it is actually that R that allows us to, to, to define the unit vector. So that I have spent some more time there just to, to make sure that, that, that you don't get lost. Uh, I guess we can do some clean cleaning here now. So uh, I think uh, that is clear to everybody. And therefore what I think all of you should endeavor to do is to understand that when we transition from a, a, from a scalar definition of Kuroop's law to the vector definition, there is some slight change in the, in the expression particularly with reference to the magnitude uh, of the vector that at the bottom uh, or at the denominator. So there are some few notes again to note, build what I've already mentioned, that uh, point one, that F21 is not the same as F12. So F being a, a vector, F1, F2, F12 is not equals to F21. They may be equal in magnitude, but they are not equal in uh, they are not equal in in vector form. So all we are saying is that the the F to one talks about the force on two due to one. That, that is always something you can say. It is like when you have it in this form, it is like you're drawing an arrow from one to two. So this is the force on two due to due to one. So uh, that, that is the easiest way to remember. And therefore, when you say uh, uh, F to one, you're saying that it is a force that is moving from two to, to one. So again, uh, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty good to understand. I have seen, so moving on, the other point that we have seen, we have seen or, Having said that F2 is not equals to F, F12 is not equals to F21, then we can actually say that Q47 holds because the only difference between these two is in the direction. And therefore, uh, the direction is uh, changes from being positive to being negative. And therefore, Q47 holds true. Now, uh, of course, this is because uh, the two unit vectors are having opposite directions. The other point that we should mention, which is point two, is that light charges, uh, of course, repair each other and uh, light charges, charges uh, attract each other. That, that's a concept that is much well known and it is just mentioned there and it has stated at figure 4.2. Now, figure, uh, the other point or point three that we should notice is that the distance between the charged bodies must be large. You normally say that uh, if you have a point charge, Q1, 
having radius r. And another point charge q2 having radius r. The distance between these two is we are defining it as capital R. So the idea we are saying at point three is that R must or small r is far much less than R than capital R. So that is a rule that must be obeyed, particularly when you are using uh Coulomb's law. Now moving forward, uh, we are saying that uh, for now we are considering that Q1 and Q2 are at rest. And number five, that Q1 and Q2 must be taken into account, or the signs of Q1 and Q2 must be considered. Because if it is well, Q1 is positive and Q2 is negative, then that is an attraction. They are getting attracted to each other. But if they are of opposite of the same sign, then the force becomes repulsion, which has different signs. So um, lastly, the charges cannot be created or destroyed. That is a, a rule of uh, uh, physics that has also applies here. Therefore, uh, notice that. Now, uh, I normally like to give some pause so that you can raise any question that, uh, that might bother you. So let me know if you have any concern uh, regarding what we have already discussed before we talk about the principle of superposition. So uh, the difference between these two for that person who has asked is purely that F12 is showing the force that is moving from the charge indicated as one towards the charge indicated as two. And if you want the other hand, F21 is the force from two towards one and therefore the difference is in the direction i guess that is clear so i will uh, consider that to be the question that uh, and i i think it is understood we say that it's always proper when i respond to your question you can always respond on chat and say that's understood now um let's talk about the principle of superposition which says that if you have uh, more than two charges then to determine the force on a particular charge we apply the principle of superposition and it, and it says or it states that if there are n charges if there are n charges q1 q2 all the way to qn located respectively at position vectors r1 r2 and r3 or r3 all the way to rn the resultant force on charge q located at point r is the vector sum of the forces exerted on q by each of the charges q1 q2 up to qn and for the people who like seeing the the illustrations consider q1 to be, oh i don't i can use the example that, that was up here it should be much much easier so um ah, i've deleted so much so let me restore. This is my charge Q1. This is my charge Q2. And assume I have another charge Q3 and many other charges Q all the way to Qn. There are many. So, but then I want to have my point of observation. I can call this one small unit charge. So we, we say that the force experienced by the unit uh, by the charge q by the small charge q due to this all these all these charges is uh, equal to the sum total the force exerted by q1 the force exerted by q2 the force by by q3 and all the way to all the for the force by qn so it's just a sum vector sum so how you write that is simply uh, as defined uh, down here, we're saying that you get the resultant force from due to Q, due to Q1, due to Q2, which is equal to F2, uh, Q3, and up to Fn defines the uh, the what the total force 
that is experienced by the charge due to the multiple charges. And of course, because we have already been able to, to define the force F1 